living creatures exist everywhere on Earth. They swim the seas, scavenge the land, and span the air. From snow-topped landscapes to baking hot deserts, animals seem to have an inbuilt survival kit to suit their environment. How did such a wide variety of life come about? Do all living creatures have a common origin? Have animals gradually changed over thousands and millions of years? The theory of evolution seeks to answer these questions. It's based on a fundamental idea. Evolution is the gradual change of life through time. It's been happening since life began and will go on for as long as there is life on Earth. All species have adapted to their environment. This is an essential ingredient in the theory of evolution. The lynx and the snow hare have both adapted to living in a snow-covered environment. Their coats blend in with the snow for camouflage. They also have big feet for their size, which distributes their weight over a larger area so they don't sink into the snow. These are advantages for both species in their struggle for survival. All species are well adapted to live in their own particular environment. For more than 130 million years, the mammals lived in the shadow of the dinosaurs. During this time, they evolved into nocturnal animals. Each generation was slightly better adapted to live in the cold and dark of night. Their hair grew longer, their eyesight got better, they developed special kinds of teeth. With the sudden disappearance of the dinosaurs, the way was open for the mammals to rule the earth. They evolved new adaptations, which sealed their success. The early mammals were to give rise to some of the most ferocious creatures on Earth, the cats. They took the place of the dinosaurs as top predators. They were multi-skilled, and they could adapt to live in a variety of environments. OK, a few things about the cats compared to other animals is the cat's eyes are located at the very front of the face. Um, this gives them the stereoscopic vision so that when they're hunting in the field, they have more, they're more in tune to every little thing going on around them. The tiger's whiskers help them um, through in the darkness as they're walking through uh, trees and bushes and things of that. It's kind of a little signal that warns them of branches that may be sticking out into their face and things of that nature. The paws are extremely powerful with huge um, giant claws. And the claws are used for grabbing the hold of the animals, dragging the animals down into the ground, and then the cats will put on their pressure bite with their canines and basically do a choke hold on the animal around the animal's throat there, okay? All cats kill their prey primarily with one simple way. All your cats have the canines, which are the four front large canine teeth here. These are what they use to grab the animal with, and this is what they use to put on the lethal hold. And what the cats will do is they'll grab the animal by the windpipe right here in the neck, and they will crush the windpipe and close it and suffocate the animal, and they will hang on to it until that animal totally dies from suffocation, okay? They also have other teeth. The front teeth here are called the incisors. These teeth are extremely sharp and powerful. These are the teeth that crush the bones. The back teeth here are also used for crushing and chewing the meat, all right? But, so keep your eyes open for these guys. Feeding is one of the most important things that an animal does, and evolution has made sure that animals are specialized for their diets. So cats are very different looking from dogs, which are different looking from horses. If we look at a cat skull, it has very few teeth, and they're all very blade-like, and they're perfect for scissoring meat, but not for much else. If we look at horse teeth, dramatic difference. They're very broad teeth, they are very square, and they are modified for eating grasses. And they're also very large relative to the cat. They have many teeth because grass is actually a very tough food to grind up. 
But dogs eat a variety of foods. They're carnivorous part of the time, but other times they're known to eat fruits and berries. And if we look at a dog's dentition, we see it has blade-like teeth that the cat has for cutting meat, but behind those teeth we see a couple of grinding teeth, which are what they use for chewing up bones and also for eating fruits, plant matter, that they enjoy. Now, the tigers are adapted to their habitat. Um, your tigers are striped, camouflage them mostly in the high grass in Southeast Asia, in the jungles of Asia, all right? Where your lions are more of a, a basic a grass color, the tan color of, of the Serengeti plains, of the grasses in the Serengeti, which helps them camouflage and adapt to their environment. Most people think cats don't like water, but some of them are actually adapted to using water, at least hunting for fish in water. And one of those is the fishing cat, which shows a little bit of adaptation, not a lot, but for fishing. So there is some webbing between its feet, which helps it scoop the fish out of the water when it's hunting. The sand cat is highly adapted for its desert environment. The color of its fur is sandy colored, so it blends in very well and can hide. It has excellent hearing and enlarged ears so that it can hear the underground prey, which it hunts in the evenings. And even more importantly, it has fur-covered soles of its feet, which protect its feet from the very high heat of the desert sand. The cheetah is a highly specialized running cat. It's perhaps the most specialized of all the living cats today. It runs, or it's been clocked at over 100 kilometers per hour. And to do that, it has greatly modified its body, or evolution has modified its body, I should say. So it has a very deep chest, which houses large lungs and a bigger heart than the average cat. It has very long limbs for its body size, which increase its stride length that make it run faster. It has a very flexible back, which flexes and extends as it runs and adds to its stride length. It's a very specialized running cat. Even when we look at the cheetah's skull, we can see adaptations for running. So if we look at the nose hole in this bobcat and in this cheetah, we can see that the cheetah has a much larger nose hole, that is nasal aperture, which is where the intake of air is for breathing. The cheetah needs this because running the distances that it does, it overheats and it runs out of breath, and it needs to catch its breath for quite a while after it's taken these long runs. The early cats adapted to living in trees, hunting other inhabitants of the forest canopy. This is a fossa a strange-shaped animal from the island of Madagascar. The early cats may well have resembled it. And then the fossil record reveals that some 20 million years ago, the cats came out of the trees in search of bigger prey. They became adapted to hunting bigger creatures. They became the ultimate killing machines. The fiercest of all was the saber-toothed cat. It had great stabbing teeth and razor-sharp claws. It seems the saber-toothed cat literally tore flesh from its victim's body. This is the skull of the saber-toothed cat that lived here in Los Angeles during the late Ice Age, approximately 10 to 40,000 years ago. It's notable in uh, the shape of the head, uh, but especially the shape of these large uh, curved canines and most living cats, these canines are very short and conically shaped. This is the isolated canine of the saber-toothed cat. On the front edge and the back edge of this tooth is very fine serrations. We presume these serrations aided in puncturing the flesh and ripping the flesh. Fossils and bones are the key to unlocking the secrets of the prehistoric world. They're vital in the theory of evolution because they reveal a great deal about the creatures that once lived and how they became extinct. Here in Los Angeles, thousands of saber-toothed cat bones have been discovered in what is now known as the tar pits. Strip away the mansions and the glitzy boutiques, peel back the LA freeways Go back about 15,000 years and the lost world of the saber-toothed cats is revealed. Today at the tar pits there is evidence of the superglue that trapped so many ancient animals. A tar-like substance seeped through oil pockets some 450 meters below the earth, luring animals to a sticky end. They would wander unknowingly into the tar trap, sink and die. A dying animal was perfect prey for the saber-toothed cat. But sometimes, 
the predator also became a victim of the dreaded tar. The tar pits allow scientists a sneak view into the world of the saber-toothed cat. Fossils and bones reveal what the animals looked like and much more besides. Injured and diseased bones can show us something about their social behavior. An example is this saber-toothed cat pelvis. Uh, this side of the hip bone is fairly normal, showing the socket of where the thigh bone would articulate. But on the other side, we see the result of that injury. Massive infection and a total re-sculpting of the socket. This would have really put this animal out of action. Um, evidence such as this shows us that there had to have been some type of cooperative feeding, either a pride structure or a smaller group, because this animal would have definitely needed help to acquire food. If the saber-toothed cat ruled the roost, had a social network, were armed with sharp teeth and big claws, why did they finally become extinct about 10,000 years ago? There are no definite answers to this, but there are theories. It may be that saber-tooths were mostly adapted for hunting from short distance ambush. They're very tough looking wrestling sort of cats and their prey may have simply outdistanced them or the kind of prey that they were specialized for may have disappeared over that time period. If species do not adapt to a changing environment, they become extinct. The round tooth cats diversified and became more successful. And we're really not sure why this happened, but it may be that the round tooth cats were in some way more adapted, more flexible in their adaptations to the new varieties of prey. If adaptation is the key to survival, how does a species adapt to a changing environment? The theory of evolution uses natural selection to explain this. Natural selection ensures that only the better adapted creatures survive in a fiercely competitive world. There are three key elements to natural selection. No two animals from the same species are identical because they have different genes. The more the genes vary within a population, the more the species is able to adapt to a changing environment. Each generation of cats will produce lots of offspring, but not all the young will survive. The cats which do survive and breed will be better adapted to their environment and so pass their genes on to the next generation. For example, the offspring of these young leopards could be born with a black or a golden coat. If they lived in a forest where the black cat is better camouflaged, then the black one will survive and have cubs. So natural selection favors these coat colors because cats that have the appropriate pattern for their background, the environment they live in, do better than cats that don't. After a number of generations, the golden cats will be very rare and the black ones will dominate the forest. Sometimes, a twist of nature, called a mutation, can introduce a new gene. If this gene is passed on through natural selection, a brand new characteristic can arise, like a white coat. This is your white tiger. Um, basically, Natasha here is the white Siberian tiger. And all your white tigers in the world have all come from one lone white tiger that was captured in India back in the early 1960s. Um, that tiger was a white wild tiger that they captured. So all the tigers you see in all the zoos around the world are all related to that one white tiger. The white tiger was the result of a sudden genetic hiccup. It may well be that the black leopard also appeared as a mutation. This new variation was then naturally selected. But Fred carries a gene, a recessive gene, that makes him come out black. But if you look really closely, you can actually see the spots on him. So the black panther, the black leopard, is truly a spotted leopard. Sometimes, cat breeders select mutations to create a new breed, like the Sphinx. It has no fur and was artificially selected when a hairless gene suddenly appeared as a mutation. 
they were first bred in the, in the 60s and there was a farmyard cat in Canada who had a litter and one of them happened to be hairless and one of the neighbours I believe took an interest in the cat and decided that it would be interesting to breed it and that's how they came about but it was basically a natural mutation within the, in the world of cats. If mammals have a common ancestor how is it that cats and dogs have paws and claws whilst horses have hooves? Do they have a common origin? If you look at the skeleton of a mammal, you'll find that regardless of what mammal it comes from, the bones are very similar. This happens to be the skeleton of a dog. These bones of the dog are actually very similar to the bones of a cat, or very similar to the bones of a human, or to herbivores such as horses. For example, humans walk on their flat feet, Dogs are carnivores, they run more swiftly, they run on the balls of their feet, and you can see this is the foot here, and the animal is running on the balls of its foot. And horses are herbivores, they have to run away from the predators, and they run on the tips of their toes. This happens to be the foot of a horse, and you can see this is this equivalent on the dog, or the equivalent of this part of a hand here. Now, how did the horse get to run on its toes? Well, it started off as a little creature about the size of a small fox terrier, and it ran on all five fingers. And then gradually, in order to run faster, it lifted up its, its fingers. And if you'll notice that if you lift your hand, first of all, the thumb comes off, then the little finger comes off, then the index finger comes off, then the ring finger comes off, and you end up walking on the toe. And this is what has happened during the evolution of the horse. And if you look at this part of the horse foot, you can see on the side here, these are the remains of the second and fourth fingers on a horse. These skeletons show the evolution of the horse from its smallest ancestor to the modern animal. It started out with five toes at the front, then grew bigger, and evolved to have three toes. Finally, the middle finger developed into a hoof. Not only do fossils reveal creatures that lived thousands and millions of years ago, they also show the order in which living things appeared on Earth. The oldest rocks at the base of the Grand Canyon contain fossils showing early forms of life. Newer rocks at the top of the canyon, and in other parts of the world, reveal creatures which appeared much later. The fossil record shows that fish-like creatures appeared in the earlier rocks before amphibians. Some of these sea creatures evolved and developed lungs and legs to become amphibians. Reptiles appeared later and may have evolved from amphibians, Finally, the birds and mammals appear in the later rocks. All species have the ability to gradually adapt to a changing environment. But whether they can adapt to the environments that humans have created is doubtful.